everyone. It is good to see you all. The lesson, let me turn this on real quick. Oh, it's already okay. The lesson text this morning will come from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 38. Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 28. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him, that's Jesus, up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. The last time I preached, I talked about the meaning of the Sabbath day, and I showed and I told, told you about a church that I visited while I was studying abroad in Europe uh, when I was an undergraduate at Free Harding University. As I mentioned then, for our very first group travel as a group as part of the program, we went to the city of Bruges, Belgium. Bruges is sometimes called the Venice of the North. <coughs> It's called that because Bruges has many beautiful canals winding throughout the city, like Venice, which is in the south of Europe. In the middle of the city is the church I showed you, the Church of Our Lady of Bruges. The main building of the Church of Our Lady has been around since about the 13th century, with the bell tower you see here uh, being built sometime later. That this was built in the 13th century always floors me. Those incredible flying buttresses you see, the high walls, the majestic roof, they were all built over 700 years ago by laborers who probably couldn't even read. Get this, they didn't even know how to send an email back then. <laughs> they couldn't make a Facebook post. How did they live? <laughs> Inside the Church of Our Lady are beautiful white walls, arches, and columns soaring upward until they meet the domed wooden ceiling above. Above the pews in the sanctuary of Our Lady are statues of Christian martyrs, reminding worshipers there of the church's cloud of witnesses and the links they have gone to follow the way of Jesus. The light shimmering through the stained glass windows draws one's eyes upward, and there one will see a crucifix hanging silently and solemnly. And below it is the altar, where the bread and the cup of the Lord's Supper are blessed on Sundays. All of this I have shown you before, but there's something in the church of Our Lady that I haven't shown you yet, and that thing happens to be my very favorite thing in it. It's a marble sculpture carved by the very hands of the great Renaissance artist Michelangelo. Its name is Madonna of Bruges, and there it is. Madonna of Bruges is a representation of Mary with the young Jesus on her lap. The artistry of the sculpture is simply exquisite. 
The way Mary's robe flows and drapes over her body is so delicate and fine that it's as though the hem of the fabric is lightly blowing in the breeze, despite the fact that it's actually as hard as a marble countertop. The legs and arms of Jesus have the classic rolly appearance of chubby toddler bodies, but it's clear the muscle underneath is firm and strong. Anyone who's had a toddler before will recognize the lifelikeness of this instant. Michelangelo, true to his style, doesn't miss a single detail. From the intricacy of Mary's clothing to the exact right proportions of every part of Mary and Jesus' body to the way the fabric of the clothes creases, folds, and hangs in precisely the right way, it's truly something to behold. This is a particularly important sculpture of Michelangelo for a few reasons. For starters, this is the first Michelangelo sculpture to leave Italy. It was bought in 1504 by two wealthy brothers who were cloth merchants, merchants in Bruges. No doubt they were at least in part attracted to this particular sculpture as they themselves would have recognized the lifelikeness of the cloth in Mary's clothing. The sculpture has stayed in Belgium since they took it there, or almost, because it was actually taken from Bruges during World War II by Nazi soldiers who were fleeing from Belgium as American soldiers advanced in Europe. Allegedly, the Nazi soldiers put this sculpture on a Red Cross truck, they sort of hid it on a Red Cross truck, between mattresses and took it to Germany along with other valuable pieces of art. And when Franklin D. Roosevelt charged a small team of soldiers, eventually to be known as the Monuments Men, maybe you've seen the movie, to find and retrieve art stolen by the Nazis, they found Our Lady of Bruges hidden in an Austrian salt mine. So, one reason the sculpture is special is because its history is special. But there's another reason the sculpture is special, and that is because Michelangelo did something with this sculpture that he had never done before. In fact, almost no one had done this before. You see, typically, artistic ex uh, art representations of Mary and Jesus feature her holding the child Jesus tightly and smiling at her beloved son, or at least looking down on him peacefully and lovingly. Uh, here, for example, is a, a mosaic from Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, Turkey, from about 700 years before Michelangelo. And here's a sculpture from 100 years before Michelangelo. It's Italian, so he probably would have been familiar with this. It's subtle, but in this piece that you see on the screen, uh, sculpted by the Italian artist Lorenzo Ghiberti, you can see the corners of Mary's mouth turn slightly upward, giving the sense that Mary has a kind of inner joy about her son that is over overflowing to her otherwise staid demeanor. Michelangelo makes a different choice, though. Mary's face in Madonna and Child is decidedly solemn, perhaps even forlorn. And unlike the representations before Michelangelo, Mary does not cling to Jesus. If you look carefully at the right of the screen, you will see Mary's hand grasping lightly to the hand of Jesus, but her hold of him is otherwise loose and open. The most magical part of this sculpture is what Michelangelo does with Jesus. At first, it looks like Jesus is sitting on Mary's lap, but look again. In fact, he's not quite sitting on her lap. Rather, he's on the edge of it, almost falling out of her lap. It's hard to show with pictures, but look at the statue in person, and it's as though the statue is moving. Jesus looks to be literally falling downward, sliding out of the lap of Mary before your very eyes. As Michelangelo depicts it, the child Jesus is wide-eyed and curious. He already has places to be and things to do. He has no time for sitting in his mother's lap. Those who have children will know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? And once you notice the restlessness of Jesus, suddenly you have some insight into why it is that Mary's face is downcast. Mary, like all parents, doesn't want to let her child go. But Jesus, even child Jesus, has to go. 
And that brings us to Luke 2, which is our lesson text for this morning. In the previous chapter, in Luke 1, the Gospel writer Luke tells us about the birth of Jesus. There's a young girl named Mary who we learn, we learn is betrothed to a man named Joseph. Think of betrothal, betrothal as something like an engagement. At that time, women would be betrothed sometime around between the ages of like 13 to 18, somewhere in there. We don't know exactly how old Mary was when she became pregnant with Jesus, but it's fair to guess she was something like 14 or 15. In any case, Mary is visited one day by the angel Gabriel, who tells her that she's going to conceive and bear a son. This son, Gabriel tells her, will inherit the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the children of Israel forever, and his kingdom shall never end. Mary is shocked by this. For one thing, Mary is a peasant girl, betrothed to a simple carpenter, more or less unknown, unnotable, and uncelebrated. Why should the second coming of King David, who will apparently overthrow the Romans who currently occupy the nation of Israel, and who will establish the undending kingdom and usher in the reign of God, come through her, simple and as humble as she is? But more than that, Mary wonders how she can be pregnant in the first place, since she's not yet married and she hasn't yet known a man. At this, Gabriel tells her that the power of the Most High will overshadow her, and miraculously she will conceive a child. He will be called the Holy One, the Son of God. Mary's response to this is simple, but bursting with the kind of faith we will see over and over in the life of Mary. I am the Lord's servant, she answers. May your word to me be fulfilled. Things then happen exactly as Gabriel said they would. Mary becomes pregnant, and she and Joseph navigate the tricky social world of a young, unmarried couple who had a child on the way. Eventually, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, the city of David, to a couple sleeping amongst animals because there was no guest, but there was no guest room for them to stay in. Now, in the passage we read earlier in Luke 2, we find that a little while after Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This, we're told, is in fulfillment of the Hebrew law, which commands every firstborn male to be consecrated to the Lord. So, faithful as she is, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to be consecrated and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is commanded in the law. And here... Luke reminds us what the sacrifice should be. He says, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. This is actually an interesting detail. It's easy to miss, though. The law Luke is referring to comes from Leviticus, chapter 12, which details laws about childbirth and consecration. In Leviticus 12, we read, When the day of purification are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, the mother shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb in its first year for a burnt offering and a pigeon or a turtle dove for purification offering. So according to Leviticus, it seems like Mary is supposed to sacrifice one lamb and one turtle dove or one young pigeon. So why does Luke say she's supposed to sacrifice no lamb and two turtle doves? The answer is that there's an exception in Leviticus. And the exception is this. But if she cannot afford a sheep, she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a purification offering. And the priest shall make atonement on her behalf, and she shall be clean. So by telling us that Mary is supposed to sacrifice two turtle doves, Luke is telling us that Mary and Joseph are poor. If you thought the Messiah would be born to a noble and aristocratic family, boy, would you have been surprised. Not only are Je Jesus' parents commoners, they are poor ones at that. While at the temple for the sacrifice, Mary meets two people, Simeon and Anna. Both are old and close to death, Luke tells us. This is again a small but important detail for Luke. Jesus is first recognized in the Gospels, throughout the Gospel of Luke, into the Gospel of Acts, by those on the margins. 
He's recognized by the very young when still in a mother, his mother Elizabeth's womb, John the Baptist leaps for joy at the sound of, G of Mary's voice. And Jesus is recognized by the very old, both men and women, here in Luke 2. This, Luke will later, later tell us in Acts 2, is in fulfillment of the prophet Joel. He writes, In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. I imagine Mary's meeting with Simeon and Anna was a special one. Simeon declared to her that Jesus would be a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. And Anna spoke of the coming redemption of Jerusalem that this young child would soon usher in. No wonder Luke tells us at the end of chapter 2 in verse 51 that Mary treasured all these things in her heart. But I imagine that Mary's meeting with Simeon and Anna was also haunting. For Simeon's last recorded to word, words to Mary were, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. No wonder Luke tells us that Mary treasured these things in her heart. Remember the downcast face of Mary in Michelangelo's Madonna of Bruges? When you read Luke 2, you realize that it's downcast for a reason. Mary knows what's coming, and she knows what it will cost her. Does she know the exact details that Jesus will be crucified before her very eyes and raised three days later? I doubt it. But does she know the words of Simeon are true? that a sword will pierce her own soul too? I feel certain that she did. And so, knowing what is coming, Mary must have wanted so badly to hold on to Jesus. Man, I do with my kids. Anytime people talk about kids going to college, even other people's kids, I, I plug my ears with my fingers and I hum as loudly as I can until the topic changes. But not Mary. Mary holds on to Jesus as she can, but ultimately, she lets him go. When he pushes away, as all kids eventually do, and she watches as he goes out into the world, knowing what it means for her and for him. The older I get, the more in awe I am at the faithfulness of Mary. At one point or another, nearly every person in Jesus' life expresses doubt in him and in his ministry. John the Baptist, Jesus' own cousin, does. He sends messengers to Jesus to ask whether he really is the Christ or whether he should look for another. We are told Jesus' brothers and sisters don't believe. We know Peter has his moments of doubt. The rest of the apostles have their moments of doubt. And those from his hometown have their doubts too. Indeed, all of Jerusalem doubts as they shall crucify him on the day of his crucifixion. But there is not a single word of doubt ever uttered by Mary. There is not a moment of hesitation. This girl, this 14-year-old girl, peasant girl, not even yet married, when she is told by an angel she will miraculously conceive and give birth to the Son of God, her response is simply, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. How much education would a girl like Mary have received? Could she even read? Could she hold her own with experts in the law or with religious elites in matters of Jewish theology? I don't know. But what I do know is that when the apostles fled, it was Mary there at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified. It was Mary who went to anoint the body of Jesus in the tomb. It was Mary there in the upper room at Pentecost. She had faith. 
She believed in her son. She knew it was her child that was destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. And she knew all of this while knowing also a sword would pierce her own soul too. God chose Mary for a reason. It was not an accident. When Jesus was preaching in his ministry, we know Jesus taught that in the kingdom of heaven, the first shall be last, that God is on the side of the poor, the mourning, the hungry, and the oppressed, that God opposes the powerful and proud, but gives grace to the humble, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and in that kingdom, grace and mercy shall have the last word. Ever wonder where Jesus gets these ideas, though? It's clear to me, at least, that he got many of them from his mother. After all, here is what Mary said after she was visited by the angel Gabriel. See if you notice any themes that feature prominently in Jesus' ministry. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowly estate of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Indeed, his mercy is for those who fear him, from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones, and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his child Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. That is a faith that will move mountains. In the churches I grew up in, it sometimes seemed like maybe we were allergic to talking too much about Mary. We looked around and saw other Christians holding her up too highly, it seemed to us. So the fear was, if we held Mary up too, even a little bit, we might be contributing to an unhealthy culture of Marian veneration. Thus, we were mostly silent about Mary. To the best of my memory, I recall not a single sermon about her, no Bible classes on her life and faith, no ex exhortations to follow her example. But the more I have thought about the life of Mary, the more I think we were made the worse off by this silence. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's true that others venerate Mary too highly. I'm not in those churches, I wouldn't know. But that can't keep us from learning from her example. I think more than anyone else in the Bible, it was Mary who understood Jesus and his ministry the clearest. How could she not, I suppose? After all, it was Mary that was the one to teach him, and it was her that knew to hold on to her son, but also to let go. And here's one last example of the kind of faith that Mary had. Mary knew what she had coming, that in one way or another she would lose who I bet she loved more than anyone else in the world. And yet, despite knowing this, it was Mary that thrust Jesus into his ministry. At the wedding at Cana, when the wedding family had run out of wine, Mary goes to Jesus and tells him of the dilemma. But Jesus objects. He says, what has this to do with me? My time has not yet come. Hasn't it? I can almost imagine her Mary saying. It's as though she knew, before even Jesus knew, that his time had come. The time was now for God to do something new in the world for the ministry of Jesus to begin, and ultimately, for his journey to Calvary to start. Even though Mary knew what this would mean for her, it was Mary that gave the final nudge to Jesus to begin his ministry. Now that is faith. And in fact, it is in this story that we read the very last recorded words of Mary in the entire Bible. She says to the servants at the wedding, do whatever he tells you. May you heed the words of Mary. Do whatever he tells you. May you, like her, respond to the call of God with only, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Amen. And may you learn to follow in the example of Mary as she followed Jesus, even when 
especially when you know that a sword will pierce your own heart too. That's it.